Welcome everyone, bienvenue à tous. On behalf of the Canadian Association of Physicists, I would like to welcome everyone to the second installment of the 2021 CAP Lecture Tour. Au nom de l'Association Canadienne des Physiciens et des Physiciennes, je voudrais vous souhaiter la bienvenue à la deuxième présentation de la tournée de conférence 2021 de la CP. My name is Dr. Gwen Grenier, and I'm an assistant professor of physics at the University of Regina in Saskatchewan. Uh, along with myself are my colleagues, Dr. Jesse Heilman, an assistant professor of physics at Carleton University, and Dr. Barbara Friskin, professor of physics at Simon Fraser University, and we will be hosting today's event. Avant de commencer, je voudrais vous donner nos plus sincères excuses pour un problème technique qui ne nous permet pas d'afficher les sous-titres français en direct. Cependant, vous êtes tout à fait bienvenus de se poser vos questions en français dans le formulaire web sur YouTube. Nous avons également ajouté le français directement dans la diapositive de la présentation d'aujourd'hui. At any time during and after today's presentations, you can submit your questions in English or in French through the web form that's linked on the YouTube page. On va commencer aujourd'hui avec un petit mot de l'ACP. The Canadian Association of Physicists is a national network of 1,700 member physicists working in Canadian educational, industrial, and research settings. Nous sommes le porte-parole des physiciens canadiens face au gouvernement fédéral, aux organismes subventionnaires et à plusieurs sociétés scientifiques international. We are a proud sponsor and supporter of physics events and activities in Canada, including the CAP Annual Congress, La Conférence Canadienne des étudiants en physique, and the publication of Physics in Canada, La Physique au Canada. For students, the CAP provides a number of programs and opportunities, including a professional certification program for practicing physicists. It organizes the Undergraduate Student Conferences, CUPC, and CCUWIP, as well as the Graduate Student Conferences, WIPC and CAM. The CAP also hosts Le Concours de Prix Universitaire, the University Prize Exam, and provides several scholarships, as well as a best student paper competition at the annual Congress. Il y a aussi un conseil d'étudiants qui établira un réseau des sociétés physiques partout au Canada, and so much more, et bien plus. Si vous êtes intéressé par les activités de l'ACP, vous êtes cordialement invité de nous joindre. Membership in the CAP is free during your BSc program, and graduate students can enjoy free membership for the first year of their program. So please join us, stay informed, and get involved in the CAP. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Dr. Samantha Lawler from Campion College at the, in the Department of Physics at the University of Regina. Dr. Lawler a fait sa thèse en astronomie à l'Université de Colombie-Britannique en 2013. After her PhD at the University of British Columbia in 2013, Dr. Lawler was awarded, um, joined the University of Victoria as a postdoctoral fellow. In 2015, Dr. Lawler was awarded a prestigious NRC Canada Plaskett Fellowship that is given to outstanding recent doctoral graduates to conduct independent research in astronomy and astrophysics at the National Research Council's Herzberg Astronomy and Astrophysics Research Center in Victoria. En 2019, Dr. Lawler a commencé sa position actuelle assistant professor at Campion College in the University of Regina in Saskatchewan. The title of today's 2021 CAP Lecture Tour presentation is Planet Nine or Planet Nine, Discoveries in the Outer Solar System. C'est avec grand plaisir que je vous présente ma collègue, my coworker, and an incredibly gifted teacher, astronomer, scientist, and Canadian physicist, Dr. Samantha Lawler. Thank you. 
Okay, I will share my screen. And here we go. Um, so thank you so much for that introduction. Um, let me just uh, give a little aside here that uh, I live on a farm and uh, it's very cold out in the barn right now. So I have baby chicks in the room with me. So if you hear peeping in the background, you're not going crazy. There's actually peeping in the background. So uh, if there's enough requests at the end, I can show you some fluffy chicks. Uh, so uh, encouragement to stick around to the end. So uh, I'm gonna talk about Planet Nine today. Um, before I start, I would like to acknowledge that I live and work and conduct my research on Treaty 4 territory, which is the homeland of the Nahiawak, Anishinaabek, Dakota, Lakota, Nakota, and the homeland of the Métis and Michif people. Um, and uh, the research that I'm going to talk about was uh, carried out on the summit of Mauna Kea, which is a sacred place to indigenous Hawaiians. Um, so, uh, so the story starts off with uh, Pluto. So Pluto is the original trans-Neptunian object. Uh, it was discovered in 1930 and it was discovered 62 years before the second uh, trans-Neptunian object or Kuiper Belt object. And uh, so because of that, it was considered to be a planet for a very long time. Um, and uh, over the years, we've gotten a better and better look at, at Pluto. Uh, it's gone from being a little dot moving between the stars to being a world. So in 2015, the New Horizons space probe flew past Pluto and took these absolutely stunning, amazing pictures of it. Um, so Pluto is covered with mountains that are made out of water ice uh, and it has glaciers that are made out of nitrogen ice right and so so this is one of my favorite pictures ever taken in in astronomy right looking over the limb of pluto you can see the shadows cast by the mountains you can see the uh faint layers of the atmosphere this looks like something out of a science fiction movie but it's real this is a real picture right so um so this is, yeah, so this is what we know about Pluto, right? It has geology. It's very different geology than, than we have on Earth uh, just because of the temperature and composition differences. Uh, but it is a world, right? Um, so just to show you a little bit closer up because it's so cool, right? So, uh, so this is what it looks like when you have mountains made out of water ice and glaciers made out of nitrogen ice. So these, these, uh, these glaciers sort of have convection cells in them that slowly boil and the, the water mountains are actually floating around on top of this, this uh, solid nitrogen that is very slowly convecting. Um, so it's a real world with geology and, uh, and mountains and an atmosphere, but it is not a planet, right? And so, uh, so the reason that it is not a planet uh, there, there were some clues early on that is pretty different than the other planets in the solar system, right? Um, its orbit is very tilted uh, from the orbits of all of the other planets in the solar system, and it's very squished. It's a very different looking orbit, right? Um, so Pluto is uh, now considered a dwarf planet. So uh, there are about 10 of these that have been discovered in the Kuiper Belt so far. This is uh, Pluto is, is actually not, it's, it's still the largest one by a few tens of kilometers, Eris, uh, but Eris weighs more. Um, so dwarf planets are uh, icy bodies or, or rocky bodies that are big enough to pull themselves into a round shape with their own gravity, but they're not big enough to clear their orbits of similarly sized objects, right? So Pluto orbits through a whole bunch of other little little objects that are similar sized. Uh, so it's not a planet because it hasn't cleared its orbit of similarly sized objects. Um, okay, so I'm gonna uh, give you some terminology that we're going to be using throughout this talk. Um, so I've already started using some of it. Uh, so uh, a, a trans-Neptunian object or a Kuiper Belt object, those are interchangeable terms and I will probably use both of them throughout the talk, uh, TNO or KBO for short. Um, I'm also going to be talking a lot about orbits during this talk. So, um, 
so I need to give you some definitions. So eccentricity tells you how elliptical is an orbit, how squished is it? So a circle has an eccentricity of zero, while a parabola, right, so squished that it doesn't actually come together again, uh, has an eccentricity of one. So Pluto itself has an eccentricity of about 0.24. Um, so these eccentric orbits will have a part, uh, there will be one point in the orbit that is the closest point to the sun, uh, that is called paracenter. And uh, we use the letter Q to, uh, to represent paracenter. So we'll be talking a lot about paracenter. So remember that term. Um, the most distant point is called apocenter, um, but you can remember which is which because paracenter is perilously close. Um, so uh, another, uh, another term we need is the inclination. So this tells you um, how tilted is an orbit from the plane of the solar system. All of the planets in the solar system are within a couple of degrees of each other. So, uh, so Pluto has an inclination of about 17 degrees from the plane of the solar system. Uh, another term is semi-major axis, right? So this is basically telling you how big is the orbit. Uh, so Earth uh, orbits the sun at a distance of one AU, one astronomical unit. Um, and that's the unit that we use for measuring distances in the outer solar system. Neptune orbits at a semi-major axis of 30 AU. Um, and uh, the main Kuiper belt is at about 40 to 42 AU. Um, so, uh, so these are many small icy bodies that orbit at similar distances. So Sedna is one of the most distant known uh, Kuiper belt objects, uh, and it is on a huge orbit, right? So at its closest point to the sun, it's 76 AU. At its most distant point, it goes out to 936 AU, right? So this is much bigger than the Kuiper belt, but it's still considered the main Kuiper belt, but it's still considered to be part of the Kuiper belt. These, these are uh, distant small bodies in the solar system. So for reference, for scale here, uh, so Voyager 1 is a space probe that was launched in uh, 1977. Uh, so it has been traveling away from the sun, going significantly faster than a bullet for uh, 43 years. It has only reached a distance of 152 AU in that time, right? So, so we're talking about really large distances from the sun here. Uh, to get even farther out, uh, there is the Oort cloud, which is uh, made up of many, many small icy bodies uh, that are on, uh, some of them are on very eccentric orbits that bring them in close to the sun once every tens to hundreds of thousands of years. And we know about these because we see them as comets. Um, so, so this is much farther away, right? So here's, uh, here's Sedna's orbit for scale. Sedna is sometimes said to be an inner Oort cloud object. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so these are the most distant bodies that we know about in the solar system. So coming back into the Kuiper belt, which is the focus of today's talk. Um, so, uh, so main Kuiper belt. So Pluto's orbit looks like this. So Pluto, I said, is on a very eccentric orbit. Um, it actually crosses the orbit of Neptune and crosses through the main Kuiper belt. Um, so, uh, so how is it able to cross Neptune's orbit without crashing? Um, so that, that uh, happens because Pluto is in what's called a mean motion resonance. So, uh, so this was first shown using uh, computer simulations of orbits. Uh, back in 1964, so this is like punch card computing, right? Um, so this very first paper that showed that Pluto is in this special kind of orbit um, was almost certainly conducted by uh, Dr. Gladys West, who is, uh, if you've seen the, the movie Hidden Figures about the, uh, the women computers who worked for, for NASA during the space race, she was one of the women in that movie. Um, so, uh, so back in this time period, in the, the 40s, 50s, and 60s, uh, women were computers. Uh, a huge number of the programmers uh, for, uh, for research were, were women, and they were not given credit as co-authors. So, uh, so that, that practice has dropped off over time. Um, 
but uh, this this paper should pro proper properly uh, acknowledge uh, Gladys West, who wasn't even acknowledged in the you know the acknowledgement sections of the paper. So, kind of an interesting historical aside. Now we're we're doing a little bit better at acknowledging people for their work in in scientific papers. Um, so, what is this special orbit? Uh, so. Um, on the left here, so uh, there are two orbits. So the blue orbit is Neptune, the purple orbit is Pluto. So this is, we're looking down on the solar system uh, in the amount of time that Neptune goes around the sun exactly three times, Pluto goes around the sun exactly twice. So now imagine looking down on that plot and rotating at the same rate that Neptune is orbiting, right? So you're holding Neptune fixed in the same place. So that's what's happening in this plot on this side. And uh, so relative to Neptune, Pluto does this sort of spirograph dance, right? And so, so this is when it's having its paracenter, right? So its paracenter location uh, is always away from Neptune, right? So it will never, because of this special orbit, it will never crash into Neptune because of this protection, right? Its paracenter is always as far away as possible from Neptune. Um, so as uh, over the years, as computation power has grown, uh, you can do orbital simulations for much longer. And uh, so, so this is uh, millions of years. And over time, that paracenter position sort of shifts back and forth relative to Neptune. Uh, but it never crosses Neptune you know, for uh, the age of the solar system. This is stable. So, uh, so this is telling us something interesting about the, uh, the history of our solar system, right? So why are these, uh, these resonances important? So, um, so this is uh, showing the, uh, the resonance between three of the moons of Jupiter and uh, here is uh, another way of looking at this, right? So here is, this is position angle, right? So it's basically telling you angle around the orbit, right? And we've got two planets. Uh, and so where they're crossing, that means that they're having a close encounter, right? That's when they're at their closest approach to each other around their orbit. Uh, here is semi-major axis for the two planets. So they're, uh, how big their orbits are, right? So when they cross, it, orbits, when they pass each other at their closest point, they actually give each other a gravitational kick, right? So their orbits do change a little tiny bit every time they pass each other. Um, and the eccentricity also changes a little bit, right? The orbits are changing due to these very small gravitational interactions. Um, so now if we look over a longer time period, right? So here's the, the same, same, uh, uh, same same uh, quantities are represented on this plot. Here's the position angle. Um, so you can see where the crosses happen, right? And, and so every time there is a close encounter, the, the um, semi-major axis sort of jumps around, right? And it just sort of happens randomly, right? But if the two planets are in resonance with each other or close to resonance, then you can see with your eye, right? So this, this crossing is always happening at almost the same position, right? So because of that, they're giving each other a gravitational kick in the same part of their orbit, right? It's like pushing a kid on a swing. Um, and uh, so over time, these two planets are coupled, right? So as one of their semi-major axes gets bigger, the other one gets smaller, right? So, so planets and, and other bodies that are in mean motion resonance with each other are coupled to each other. Um, so what is that telling us about Pluto? Um, so Pluto, uh, we, we now think that Pluto was uh, captured in this mean motion resonance and pushed outward over time. Uh, and that explains its weird eccentric orbit. If, uh, if Neptune moved outward and its mean motion resonance is also moved outward. Uh, so here's a nice movie showing this. This is called smooth migration, right? So down here you can see over time, the semi-major axes of these are the four giant planets. The little black dots are uh, proto Kuiper belt objects from before, uh, from the very early days of the solar system. And uh, just over time, very gentle scattering sort of pulls Neptune's orbit outward. As it moves outward, its mean motion resonances also move outward and it can trap 
uh, Kuiper belt objects in these mean motion resonances. So a good Canadian analogy, like a snowplow, it can capture them and gently push them outwards, right? Um, so, uh, so we know now that there are a lot of Kuiper belt objects in resonance. Um, but it's, uh, so we know that something happened uh, to change the Kuiper belt from uh, what was originally uh, expected. So um, I'm going to show plots like this several times. So this is eccentricity and inclination versus semi-major axis, um, right? And what, what uh, scientists originally theorized was that the Kuiper belt should be a leftover belt of planetesimals that are on very low inclination circular orbits. So as Kuiper belt objects were discovered, uh, astronomers expected to find something like this. So Pluto is already totally not following that trend, right? Um, so over time, more and more Kuiper belt objects were discovered and basic, almost none of them fall into this, uh, this flat, cold flat disk that was expected, right? Um, but the other thing that's interesting is these discovered orbits don't match uh, the predictions from, uh, from smooth migration, the snowplow idea doesn't, also does not seem to produce uh, what we observe. So another uh, possibility for how uh, this uh, solar system reshuffling could have happened. So again, we're looking down on the solar system. The little green dots are, are Kuiper belt objects. The giant planets are, um, are in closer to the sun. You can see that uh, Neptune starts out at about 20 AU instead of 30 like it is today. So, so the giant planets are giving each other little gravitational kicks. They're kind of moving around a bit from scattering Kuiper belt objects. And all of a sudden, there's this huge change right there. And the giant planets jump outwards and completely destroy the Kuiper belt. Um, and then as the, the giant planets sort of calm down and recircularize, then they can capture Kuiper belt objects into resonance again. Um, so this is, uh, this is called the Nice model. So this is another way to, uh, to create the Kuiper belt that we see today. Um, so we have these two different models, right? So, so these, these computer simulations produce distributions of orbits. So we can say, uh, you know, this is what we should see if, uh, if smooth migration happened. This is what we should see if the Nice model happened, right? So, so this is a Nice model simulation. This is a smooth migration simulation, right? Uh, and this is, so this is all eccentricity versus semi-major axis. Um, and this is what we actually detect, right? So what about observational biases? So, uh, so observational biases in uh, the Kuiper belt are quite nasty. Um, so, uh, so Kepler's second law tells us that uh, as planets move on eccentric orbits, they will go faster when they're close to the sun and they will go slower when they're farther from the sun, right? So equal areas and equal times, these little pie slices that are getting swept out are the same area. Uh, so the planet has to move slower uh, as, as, it, uh, as it gets farther from the sun. Um, so the other thing is that Kuiper belt objects don't make their own light, right? They're not like stars. So we're seeing them in reflected light. So that means that light from the sun has to travel all the way out to them and its brightness drops off by one over distance squared. Uh, and then it has to reflect all the way back to us. So another one over distance squared. So that means that if you have a Kuiper belt object like this and it's 10 times closer to the sun uh, at pericenter than at apocenter, it's gonna be 10,000 times fainter out here. So we are very severely uh, uh, constrained to finding them at their closest point. Um, the other thing that's important is uh, where you look on the sky, right? So, so scientists, astronomers too, uh, don't really like to say, oh, we looked at, at the spot on the sky and we didn't find anything, <laughs> right? But that's actually a really important constraint. So that brings us to this theory of planet nine that there's these very distant Kuiper belt objects that are all, their orbits are all clustered in the same direction, right? So that means that all of them had their closest points to the sun and were the most detectable at one place on the sky. So were they all detected there because there's actually nothing over here or because nobody looked there, right? Um, so 
the solution to this problem is to measure and publish your observational biases. And that's exactly what we did with the Outer Solar System Origin Survey. Uh, so this was a Canadian-led international collaboration of about 40 astronomers. Um, and uh, we surveyed the sky between 2013 and 2018. Uh, we used the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope on Mauna Kea uh, using uh, Megacam. So you can see this is the camera. Oops, this is the camera that we used, right? You can see compared to somebody's hand, it's a very large camera. So this is great for finding Kuiper Belt objects, right? Um, so it has a square degree field of view on the sky. Here's the full moon for reference, uh, right? So the, so every time you take a picture, you get a really big chunk of the sky, and you can try to find Kuiper Belt objects in that really big chunk of sky. Um, so we find Kuiper Belt objects now the same way that Pluto was discovered uh, in 1930. Uh, you take a picture of a spot on the sky, take a picture a couple hours later and a couple hours later and see what moves. Um, and uh, so by looking at how fast they move and by tracking them over time, uh, you can measure their distances and eventually measure their orbits. Uh, some of the most distant ones you have to track for years in order to measure the orbit very precisely. Um, so we uh, we took so that big that big field of view that square degree um, we uh, tiled that across different parts of the sky into blocks where we had basically you know really good coverage. So we said, okay, we found all of the Kuiper Belt objects in this chunk of the sky, and here's another chunk of the sky, right? So so we uh, so for each of these uh, spots on the sky, we know exactly how much area we covered. We know how faint of an object we could have found. And we know how good we were at tracking them after we discovered them. We were very good at that, by the way. <laughs> um, so, uh, so this is uh, looking down on the solar system, right? So here's Neptune. Uh, these little pie slices are, um, are survey blocks. And the blue dots are the real Kuiper Belt objects that we discovered. Uh, so we found 840 uh, TNOs. Um, for reference, there were only about 2,000 known before the survey started, and about half of those have been lost because uh, the orbits were not well measured. So, uh, so we effectively doubled the number of uh, well-measured TNOs with one survey. Um, and because we know our survey biases really well, we can uh, we can sort of de-bias our discoveries, right? So. Again, here's this eccentricity and inclination versus semi-major axis, right? So this is our, our discoveries um, from part of the survey. And uh, this is uh, de-biased. So that means that, right, so for example, like this, this little guy out here at high eccentricity and really large distances, um, it was really hard to find, right? So that means that if we found one, there has to be a whole bunch more out there that we did not see. So, uh, so by very carefully using a survey simulator, uh, we can test uh, models of what the solar system actually looks like and compare it with our real detections in a statistically robust way. Um, so this is a map of the Kuiper belt, uh, the de-biased Kuiper belt. Uh, so all of these little tiny dots, that's a real Kuiper belt object. Uh, so because of the survey, we know that there are about 400,000 uh, Kuiper belt objects bigger than 100 kilometers. And this is their approximate orbital distribution. So uh, that's pretty cool. That's a lot of Kuiper belt objects. And we only know about, about two to 3,000 of them, depending on how you count. OK, so let's talk about one specific type of these. Um, so, uh, so for the planet nine theory, uh, we have to focus on the high paracenter TNO. So, uh, so this is um, everything that's listed in the minor planet center database. So this is a database of all small bodies in the solar system. Um, but they don't necessarily record uh, how uh, like the biases that went into discovering them. So it's a little, you have to be a little bit careful when you use uh, uh, your, when you uh, pull objects from the minor planet center database. Um, so this is a uh, paracenter distance versus orbit size or semi-major axis, right? So, um, so these are all of the known uh, 
sort of high paracenter TNOs, right? So these are the ones that never get very close to the sun and they're on really big orbits. So these are the ones that are supposed to be uh, confined by planet nine. Um, so for reference, right? Uh, so back to this, this other diagram of, uh, of the outer solar system, here's the main Kuiper belt. Uh, here's Pluto's orbit, right? So, so we think that the main Kuiper belt formed there. That's the leftovers of, uh, from planet formation and it wasn't disrupted by migration. Uh, Pluto we think was captured onto this orbit when Neptune migrated. Uh, Eris comes in close enough to Neptune that it was scattered. That makes sense, we understand that. But Sedna never gets closer to Neptune than almost 50 AU away. So how did it get there? We don't know. <laughs> um, so, uh, so let's look at this plot again, now with a little bit more information, right? So here's Sedna for reference. Um, so again, paracenter distance versus orbit size. Uh, so at really large distances, uh, you can actually get tides from the Milky Way galaxy, and that will change the size of the orbits. Uh, so these ones we can explain. They, we, we understand what has caused them to be on these weird orbits. Uh, the ones that are in here, right, so 50 AU, that means that the, uh, a paracenter of 50 AU means that it never gets closer to Neptune than 20 AU away. But if you run really long time scale uh, orbital simulations, like hundreds of millions of years, um, oops, the, uh, these ones actually do move around just a little bit uh, over time. So these ones are actually getting very weak gravitational kicks from Neptune. So we can explain these ones too, uh, just through very long uh, computer simulations. But these guys up here, we have no idea, right? Like they're, they don't get close enough to Neptune. So how did they get there? Um, so uh, so these, these high paracenter TNOs are, um, right? So, so this is the original uh, planet nine theory. So, um, so the first six of these high paracenter TNOs, the ones that are never get very close to the sun, um, were all kind of pointed in the same direction, right? And so one way to explain that, that clustering is with a giant planet. So a 10 earth mass planet uh, that has a several hundred AU orbit, right? So this is really far away from the sun all the time, which is why maybe it's there and we didn't know about it, right? Um, so, uh, so for reference, this is uh, this planet nine theory uses the, the most distant Kuiper belt objects. So we'll say, you know, some, some arbitrary cutoff at the uh, large paracenter distance. Um, so the problem is that these six, uh, these six high paracenter TNOs were drawn from uh, the Minor Planet Center database. So we don't know the observational biases. Six different objects from six different surveys, we don't know where they look. So we don't know what the biases are. So, uh, so why don't we use our survey where we do know the biases really well? What can we say there? So. Uh, so out of the 840 that we discovered, only four of them are really high paracenter. Um, so are they aligned, right? We should be able to, to run this, uh, this simulation, right? Um, so, uh, right so, so if the planet nine theory is true, then all four of these should be clustered in the same direction, right? And the same direction as these first six high paracenter TNOs. So, so this is the planet nine plot that you see all over the place. Um, I'm going to reorient it. So now I've rotated it um, and I'm going to update it with all of this, the new discoveries in the last few years. So, uh, so this is what it looked, what that plot looks like now, right? So you can see that there's actually a couple of them that are in completely the opposite direction. Uh, the clustering is very wide, um, but there's still, right, there's definitely still some kind of clustering happening, right? Um, okay, so what about observational biases? So, that, so to deal with that, we have to talk about just our survey where we know the observational biases, right? So, uh, so these four red orbits are the, the OSIS discoveries, right? And so you can see that uh, two of them are, are in this clustering. One of them is totally not clustered with anything, and one of them is in the opposite direction, right? So um, 
when you actually run the statistics, this is consistent with a uniform distribution. Um, there was another recent survey uh, that kept very careful track of all of their biases. Um, it's actually a piggybacking on a cosmology survey. Uh, and uh, they discovered uh, about 300 TNOs. Um, and a few of those were also high paracenter, right? So, um, so the blue orbits now are the ones discovered by uh, the DES survey. And um, so again, you can see, right? So, so they actually looked only over, <laughs> over where you would expect to, to find the clustering, right? So, um, so uh, you know, two of these discoveries are almost 180 degrees apart. So you know, maybe, maybe there's still some clustering there, but when you actually run the statistics uh, and uh, take the biases into account, it is completely consistent with a uniform distribution. Um, so this paper just came out last week. Um, it's been getting a lot of press. Uh, so this was taking the OSIS survey result, the DES survey result, and another survey, um, and uh, combining them statistically into one survey. So now instead of just like five detections in one and five detections in another, um, now there are 14, which you know it's still it's not very much, right? But uh, but you can actually get some, some pretty uh, statistically powerful uh, results from that. And basically, this plot makes it very clear, right? So the white dots are basically orbits that these combined surveys were sensitive to, and the red dots are the real detections. And uh, so you can see that you find them where you look, right? <laughs> so this, this distribution is completely consistent with a uniform distribution. There is no evidence that uh, high paracenter TNOs are aligned, right? So uh, yeah, so we, we have no evidence for the reason that the Planet Nine theory was proposed. So, uh, so why did this happen, right? Like the, you know, the people who have proposed the Planet Nine theory are incredibly smart and are incredibly good observers, right? Um, and I should add that I don't hate Planet Nine, right? Like this is, uh, right, as scientists, this is what we do. Someone proposes a theory and we all test it in different ways, right? And so, uh, so this is me in the Planet Nine theory and I find no evidence in favor of it. Um, so, uh, so this is another way of looking at those, those original six TNOs. And over here, I've run a, uh, a fake survey, right? So, so the gray or the sort of dotted uh, lines are orbits that I fed into the survey. And I said, okay, so what if I just observed from one telescope in one season? What would I detect, right? And what you detect is that, right? The first six that you pull out are aligned. So it's, it's just uh, without knowing your biases, you cannot say if this clustering is real. There are so many weird biases in the orbital direction and you're so biased toward finding these objects at paracenter, right? So, uh, so uh, it's so important to keep track of this and to make it public. Um, okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about uh, these very distant uh, TNOs, right? So, uh, so right, these are the the really weird, uh, uh, weird high paracenter TNOs that we can't explain. Um, so now, uh, what we've done here is look at how hard is it to detect each of these, right? So, if you uh, put down a Kuiper belt object out here, like how many Kuiper belt objects do you have to put? Uh, at in this kind of a really large semi-major axis, uh, really high paracenter orbit before you detect them, right? So blue colors mean harder to detect, yellow colors mean easier to detect. So, you know, no, no big surprise, there are more real objects, the purple, purple dots uh, in this part down here where it's easier to detect them, right? But the thing that I keep coming back to that really gets me scratching my head is so these two are pretty hard to detect, right? Like they're starting to get into like green colors of, of hard to detect. Um, but there should be some more Kuiper belt objects here that aren't as high paracenter that should be easier to detect. Why don't we see anything there? Um, and, uh, and this is something that I've, I've tested with uh, 
with the computer simulations, right? So, uh, so again, uh, paracenter distance versus semi-major axis. And again, the purple, purple dots are the real TNOs. Uh, so the, the green dots are uh, from a Planet 9 simulation that, that I ran with my colleagues. Um, so we basically built the Kuiper Belt and at, uh, while Planet 9 was also orbiting in the distant solar system and looked to see what does the Kuiper Belt look like. And having Planet 9 there, it's really good at creating these, these high paracenter TNOs, right? That's one reason that this theory was so attractive, right? But you can see that there are a lot of green dots uh, inside this box that should be easier to find than these two weirdos up here, right? So why don't we see them, right? So, uh, so it's another, another reason that, uh, that I don't think that the Planet Nine theory is the right explanation for this. Um, uh, another idea is a rogue planet. So this would be like a Mars-sized planet that used to orbit in between the giant planets and then got ejected after a few hundred million years. Um, so that's also pretty good at producing these high paracenter orbits. So that's the little tiny black dots in the simulation. But again, you would expect to have a lot of, of little uh, of detections in uh, this easier to detect space. So, uh, so that's, that's a big question that I have still. Um, so yeah, so basically we don't like Planet Nine is a very tr attractive theory because um, it lets us, uh, it explains these high paracenter orbits, right? Um, but uh, it, it doesn't, like the only reason that it was proposed was because of this clustering in detected high paracenter TNO orbits, which appears not to be real. Um, the the uh, surveys where we know the biases very well have not detected that. So, um, so what, what could be producing these weird orbits, right? And so it turns out that there is, there are a lot of possible theories. Um, the planet nine theory is only one of uh, many different possible theories. Um, and uh, which of these theories uh, is, is uh, the correct one? Which one uh, reproduces the solar system as we see it today? We need to find more of these really hard to detect uh, distant Kuiper Belt objects. So, uh, so there's a lot left to discover, right? We, we still don't, uh, don't know how to explain some of the orbits that we know are real, right? Um, so the OSA survey discovered 840 uh, new TNOs and uh, we know the biases really well. So that gave us a lot of great statistics on the, the orbits that we see, um, but it's, a, it's done now. Um, but uh, LSST is coming. So, uh, so this is uh, now called the uh, Vera Rubin Observatory. So this is an eight meter class telescope that is uh, being built in Chile. Uh, I think this is from a, about a year ago now. Uh, so so they're, they're moving along. Uh, COVID of course has slowed down everything, um, but this is going to survey the entire night sky every two to three days. Right, so it's going to discover thousands of new TNOs. Um, unfortunately, it's not going to get quite deep enough to find these really faint uh, distant objects. So we still also need targeted surveys uh, to find those. So there are some ongoing, um, but uh, that's the best way to answer uh, the, the, the questions that I have about how, how the outer solar system formed. Um, so this should be coming online next year if there aren't too many more delays. Um, so we have a lot left to discover, but are we actually going to be able to see it? Um, so this is the depressing part of my talk. Uh, so, um, so probably most of you know that uh, the uh, American private company SpaceX is in the process of launching batches of 60 satellites into orbit every two to three weeks, right? So, um, so this, these satellites are for uh, internet communication, right? So, so broadband or uh, high-speed internet um, anywhere in the world. Um, but in order to do that, they need more satellites than have ever been launched before. So there are currently more than a thousand Starlinks in orbit. Um, that is 25% of active satellites. And those were all launched in the last year or so. 
Uh, by the end of this year, they will be 50% of all active satellites. Uh, they are in lower orbits than the majority of satellites, which means that they are very reflective and bright and easy to see. So, uh, so probably many of you have actually seen these with your eyes when you go outside at night, right? You don't need a telescope to see them. They're quite bright. Um, so, uh, so this could change the night sky forever. Um, so this is uh, a simulation showing, uh, so Starlink's original plan was to launch 12,000 satellites. Um, they've now upped that to 42,000 satellites. So multiply this by three and a half. Um, this is the instantaneous positions of 12,000 satellites over the Earth. So what does that mean for, for us? Um, so this is looking at the number of starlings above the horizon at any moment by latitude, right? So uh, here's, you know, hundreds of satellites. The blue line is the, the total number. Um, hundreds of satellites above your horizon at any moment, right? So most of Canada's population is uh, in this band here at uh, almost the peak of this. So hundreds of satellites at any moment. But how many will you be able to see? Um, so, uh, so these are simulations for 52 degrees north. So this is Saskatoon, Regina, Calgary, Edmonton, Vancouver is not too far off. Um, this is what it'll be like. Um, so in the summertime, uh, there will be 500 to 400 satellites lit up in the sky at any moment. Um, in the winter, it's not quite as bad, but there will still be hundreds of them visible uh, within a couple hours of, of sunset and sunrise. Um, so lots of, of uh, amateur astronomers and stargazers have already seen this. Um, astrophotographers are particularly impacted, uh, right? So uh, if you go to a dark sky preserve and look up, you will see, if you, well, actually, if you're in the suburbs, uh, you could potentially see more satellites than stars in the sky at any given moment. Uh, if you're in a very dark place, you'll see more stars, but you'll be looking at them through a grid of, of slowly moving dots. Um, so needless to say, so that's what it'll do for your eyes. Uh, needless to say, this is going to be devastating for the type of wide field astronomy uh, that we need in order to find more distant Kuiper Belt objects, right? And, you know, astronomy, I, I will totally acknowledge astronomy is a luxury science, but uh, but this is also how we find hazardous near-Earth asteroids, right? Uh, and uh, that's not a luxury. <laughs> that's important to do. Um, so Starlink's, uh, SpaceX's goal for the Starlinks is to, uh, to make, star, uh, make them seventh magnitude, right? So in astronomy, we use magnitudes. It's a logarithmic scale. Um, so seventh magnitude is, is just below what you can see with your naked eye. Um, that currently their darkest satellites are only about magnitude six and a half. So they haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, and they change brightness a lot, right? Like this is not, uh, the, the brightness of their satellites is not a consideration that they've had until astronomers yelled a lot about it. And it's not clear how much better they can make it. Um, so, uh, so seventh magnitude uh, is uh, compared to the Kuiper belt objects that we try to find. So these are 25th magnitude, right? So this is a logarithmic scale. That means that um, the starlings that will fly through our field of view are 15 million times brighter than the Kuiper Belt objects that we're trying to find, right? So uh, the, this is going to be bad. <laughs> uh, LSST, the, the Vera Rubin Observatory, has already calculated that they'll lose about 30% of their observation time uh, due to satellites. Um, and it's not just SpaceX. SpaceX is just the first one, right? So uh, there's a whole list of companies that are lining up to do the same thing. So uh, there is no regulation on this right now. Uh, the only laws are from 1968. We need international regulation of satellites now. Uh, this is important. This is going to change. You know, this is this isn't like light pollution from a city where you can you can drive out to the mountains and go camping and get away from it. This will be everywhere in the world. So, uh, so you know, broadband internet is important, but is it more important than seeing the stars? Like that's you know a serious consideration. Um, so, uh, so this is uh, right. So just to to wrap things up, 
uh, give you my uh, my summary here, right? So we've learned a lot about the Kuiper Belt uh, through space missions, through telescope observations, uh, through computer simulations. Um, and uh, this has taught us that the giant planets migrated from where they originally formed. Um, uh, we're pretty sure that Planet Nine doesn't exist at this point. Um, and there's still a lot of weird uh, orbits that we can't explain. So we, we would ideally like to uh, find more of these weird high paracenter orbits in order to test uh, theories for how our solar system came to be. Um, and then just the last point is uh, the night sky is about to change. So go out and enjoy it now. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Samantha. Um, we can, hang on for a second. Sorry, just baby came into the room backwards and there would be crying soon if I didn't. <laughs> um, so uh, we have a couple uh, questions. Um, first uh, question says, is there, can we measure some properties of TNOs except for their orbit? Uh, and if yes, how? Okay, so yeah, we can measure a lot about TNOs. Um, so the ones that are brighter, uh, we can actually get spectra of, and that, will, that tells us something about the chemicals that are on the surface. Um, we can measure the light curve, so how, how bright they are and how faint they are, like how much their brightness changes over time, right? And that's telling us about the rotation and about, you know, dark and light splotches on the surface, so we can learn a little bit about the surface features. Um, we can learn a little bit about atmospheres and rings. So there's one Kuiper Belt object that um, has, is known to have rings, uh, it's Haumea, and um, we learn that by very carefully measuring the orbits and predicting when uh, a Kuiper Belt object will pass in front of a star and then lining up a whole bunch of telescopes along what basically would be the shadow. And you can measure how long that star blinks out for. And that tells you the shape of it. And you can look for rings and sometimes moons. And uh, there's some really weird shapes out there. <laughs> Very cool. Um, the follow-up question for this person, which I think is just a quick answer, but why does the Pluto seem orange on the New Horizons picture? Yeah, so that, that's its, its real color, right? If, if we could look at Pluto, that's what color it would be. Um, there is a process called space weathering that I don't know a whole lot about, but um, it builds up uh, chemicals on you know, basically like hard radiation hitting the surface of un uh, unprotected uh, bodies in the solar system. And um, that creates a reddish kind of uh, uh, chemical called tholins. So almost everything in the outer solar system is red. There's red things and very red things. <laughs> Uh, relation to that, where where if, if we're talking about these transit chain orbits, does the heliopause fall in there? Ah, good question. So uh, I think that is way farther out. Like I think because um, the Voyager probe went through that a few years ago, so I think it's something like 120-ish AU. I'm not totally sure about that, and I think it's different in different directions also. Um, that's something that's not very well studied because we've only sent a couple of probes far enough to pass through it. Great. Um, someone would like to know how mean motion resonances form. Yeah, so, so that, that's part of the migration. So, uh, so probably, uh, right, so these, these orbits are coupled to each other, right? So, uh, so if one of them moves, then the other one also gets pushed along with it, right? So when you see mean motion resonances, that's telling you that migration happens. So, uh, so we see lots of resonances in the Kuiper belt. We see resonances among Jupiter's moons. That means they probably migrated inwards together. Um, we see lots of resonances in uh, exoplanet systems, right? And so that's telling us that those exoplanets also migrated together. Cool, and when, what was the reason in your simulation of the Nice model for the metastable state to stop or to, to fail, like that everything jumped yeah. out? So it's, it's, uh, it's sort of chaotic, right? So if you run a bunch of uh, Nice model-like simulations, so, so that's what the metastable means, like it's stable, but we don't know for how long. Um, and uh, so our solar system currently is actually in a metastable state on billion year timescales. Um, there was a paper that showed that there's something like a 1% chance that uh, Mercury's orbit will do something like that 
in the next, you know, 10 billion years, which, you know, the sun's going to die in 5 billion years. So it's not very likely, but it is possible, right? So, uh, so yeah, it's just random chaos that causes it. Um, do we have any way of detecting uh, things, uh, these like very large orbit objects around other stars in the same way that we do uh, exoplanets? Oh, that's okay. That's a good question. So this is this is something else that I study. Um, so we can detect them, but indirectly. Um, so it's actually around other stars. It's actually a lot easier to find dust than it is to find planets, and that's because of the large surface area, right? If you if you take a planet and smash it down into dust grains, it has a lot more surface area, right? So um, so we find. Uh, Kuiper belt objects uh, around other stars by looking for dust. And we can only find Kuiper belts that are much more massive than our own uh, because they have to be actively colliding with each other and creating this dust. So, uh, so our solar system doesn't have enough dust for us to find it around another star, um, <clears throat> but uh, other systems do. So we do know that there are small bodies around other stars. We can't measure the individual orbits though. Okay, um, and then a couple uh, questions uh, about the the satellite things. So as a as a about the Starlinks uh, and the act activation the, the the citizen involvement that needs to take place in there. Can what can we as citizens, scientists, or students do about fighting for regulations of these satellites that interfere with astronomical observations? Yeah, so that's a good question. This is right. This is a really weird uh, area because nobody has ever had to deal with this before, right? So this is an American private company that's doing it. So there's not really a whole lot that uh, that we can do. You can uh, encourage your uh, your local governments, your provincial governments, maybe even the federal government to not give out subsidies for people to use uh, Starlink internet um, to encourage them to instead uh, fund better uh you know cell tower internet that's what i'm on right now by the way cell tower internet um or uh or other options right of uh, you know uh expand the the fiber network right so so there's a lot of uh a lot of ways to encourage other uh internet right um which is the the driving force behind this right it's a it's a private company if they don't make money it won't continue um but uh, but a lot of people are jumping on it because they don't have other options. So, um, so that's the one thing. Uh, there is uh, some regulations have been proposed to the UN, um, but uh, you can tell your MP that <laughs> this is something to look out for. But all right, this is like a lot beyond uh, what a single citizen can do. Um, so be active in your local uh, amateur astronomer community um, and just make other people aware of this, right? There is a deep price to be paid for Starlink internet. I think a lot of people don't know that. Cool. All right. So maybe one or two more. So uh, why are there no TNOs at high semi-major radius and low eccentricity? Your slides seem to show a definite correlation ah, okay. that eccentricity grows in semi-major access. Yes. Okay. So that is an observing bias, right? Because if you did have uh, uh, a low eccentricity orbit at large semi-major axis, it's never going to get very close to the sun, right? So that means that it's hard to see. It will never get bright enough unless it's really, really huge. Um, so the ones that we find are the ones that are on very eccentric orbits, and we find them when they come in close. Uh, so yeah, so that is a, that is totally an observation bias. Good, good eyes for picking up on that. Great. And related, are there any other major biases in observing TNOs besides sky direction and pericenter viewing? Um, there's a little bit with uh, inclination because, um, uh, right, so most uh, TNO surveys, you want to find as many as possible. So we look where they are densest on the sky. There's the most of them, which is in the plane of the solar system, right? So if you look at higher inclinations, um, it, there's not going to be as many Kuiper Belt objects to discover, but they're on orbits that we don't know a lot about. So I'm actually part of a survey right now where we're trying to, to look uh, at higher inclinations and, and see what's there, because we really don't have a good view of that yet. Great, thank you. Um, I think that's all the time we have for questions for the moment. There were a number of questions about the Starlink satellite. So it sounds like we've got some uh, uh, energy from the, from the viewers. So um, anybody who didn't have their question answered, uh, there will be 
access to these questions um, uh, by the speaker afterwards, and uh, you can try to engage that way. So I'll hand it back over to you, Gwen. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so in closing, la semaine prochaine, le 24 février, la tournée des conférences 2021 de la CP continue. The 2021 CAP Lecture Tour continues next week on February 24th, and our speaker will be Dr. James Chow from Princess Margaret Cancer Center and the University of Toronto. Dr. Chow's talk is entitled Monte Carlo Simulation and Artificial Intelligence in Cancer Therapy and Medical Imaging. And before we end today, on behalf of my colleagues, Dr. Jesse Heilman and Dr. Barbara Friskin, I would like to thank Dr. Lawler once again for giving today's fantastic CAP lecture. And a big thanks to all of you watching at home. Merci à tous et à bientôt.